So, uh, thank you so much for everybody for coming. We, we thank you to be here. We are privileged and are happy to have uh, Professor Dr. Eba Osianilson. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that you are here. And I'll let you introduce yourself um, uh, uh, to the people who are here today. Uh, we thank you and we appreciate you. Please, over to you. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here together with you today for this uh, very um, interesting um, um, topic and uh, the interesting uh, webinars you're organizing. So I thank you very much for, for that. It's a great pleasure. I am professor in innovation and open online learning. I'm based in Sweden, in Lund, in the south of Sweden. Um, I will talk to you today about quality in open online learning, a matter of human rights and social justice, which is actually my favorite topic. <laughs> um, I, am, um, uh, I do a lot of things. Um, I have worked for many years at Lund University here in Sweden, but I left uh, five years ago. Uh, so I run my, my own company and I'm an independent researcher and I work for many universities as a consultant in Sweden, but uh, actually I work mainly internationally and I am involved in more or less all the organizations which are dealing with open online flexible uh, learning and um, my special area is about quality. So I am now for the third year uh, sharing the ICD OER advocacy committee. And our mandate for this year is especially on the implementation of the OER recommendation by UNESCO. <clears throat> so I'm also an ambassador for the global advocacy of OER. With ICD, I do a lot of other things as well. I'm in the exec executive committee and I am, uh, I'm, I'm also in the quality network for Europe. And I have also done uh, two research studies for ICD, one which I will talk about a bit uh, today, about quality, and the other one is about the blended learning. I'm also in the EDEN, it's the European Distance and E-Learning Network. I'm in the EC and also sharing the, um, the EDEN uh, special interest group about quality in uh, open and flexible learning. And we had just for three days uh, had our annual conference and due to the circumstances it was uh, online it, it was pro so professional we had some 300 delegates from over 40 countries uh, i'm also in the uh, swedish association for distance education where i'm the vice president and i work together with iso and the swedish institute for standards and also the job and skills coalition sweden that is just some of my tasks I'm, carry on right now. Um, if you have any reflections or questions to you in the, the way, please um, write them in the chat. Uh, so I will try to, to follow and uh, also we will have a dialogue uh, uh, in the end. But if there are something urgent or something related to what I'm saying, uh, just please write in the chat. So once again, thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. <coughs> Uh, my presentation is available um, via your conference, of course, I think, but also via my SlideShare uh, account. And I always used to have uh, uh, this slide for acknowledgement. Uh, it is uh, CC BY and CNCA. Uh, uh, sorry, SA. <laughs> um, first, we have to think, what is really the purpose of education nowadays? That is the first question we have to ask ourselves before we can talk about quality and what quality is in open online learning. Today, it is very much about just for me and just in time learning. So that learning and teaching and educational paradigm has changed a lot. And not at least due to the uh, very terrible situation which we have gone through um, during, during the spring with the COVID-19. I will say that um, 
I never had any presentations nowadays without always starting with the UNESCO Sustainability Development Goals. And we all know that there is a special one for education, which emphasizes access, equity and inclusion, quality, lifelong learning and gender equality. <clears throat> so first we have to consider what that means before we are talking about anything else about quality. Hello, Asana. I see that you are here. Good to meet you. Uh, the SDG is, uh, 4 is important, of course, but um, there are all the others as well. And I have just written some of them here, which also UNESCO used to uh, emphasize themselves when they are talking about uh, the SDG 4 and how they are related to the others. For example, number 5, 9, 10, 16 and 17. And especially number 16 is about justice. And that's also why I have in my title already uh, a question of human rights and social justice. <clears throat> we have all gone through this uh, terrible time uh, this spring with COVID-19. And so many people have suffered, so many countries have suffered and it's awful and terrible and we are still, uh, we still don't see the end of it. However, uh, I think from all over the world, especially in education, we have learned a lot because the question about what is education about, what is learning about, <clears throat> and what um, it's not, we have learned that it's not just about content and facts and figures, we have learned that it's really a social process and it, um, it's about emotions, feelings, humanity, um, belonging, being together, etc. So what are the lessons we have learned? And I think that that will shape the agenda which we will have, we, which we will have from now on. And it has also uh, given us uh, some lessons about what are the, the gaps. So the COVID-19 didn't disrupt education. It showed us the gaps. UNESCO has another initiative, <clears throat> which is about the futures of education. And maybe you think that it's a spelling mistake, but it is not. It is about futures because there's not just one future. There are many. And they look in different ways and we have to embrace them all. This initiative was launched in uh, uh, autumn 2019 and it goes beyond the SDGs. Of course, it is built on them, but it goes beyond. <clears throat> and it is the futures of education, learning to become. So we can here also see that the paradigm shift, there's a paradigm shift from uh, offering education to learning to become, to see, see education and learning from the individual side. So it's a global initiative about reimagining how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and on the planet. <clears throat> And the initiative uh, catalyzing a global debate on knowledge, education, and learning. I don't know if you um, know about it, but for sure you do. You can take part in it in different ways. There is a survey, uh, there is a, a models how you can organize workshops within your center or institution. And if you like, you can write blog posts because UNESCO really want, would like to have the bottom up perspective they don't have the answers. They will listen to people and the communities, the public. <clears throat> so, um, let me see, I have a short video, but uh, hmm. it seems that it doesn't work for some reason. Okay. Uh, I just uh, tried it uh, before coming here. But anyway, there is a short video, just uh, one, two minutes. But you will have the slides, so please have a look, look at it. And I really would uh, like to encourage you because it really describes in just one to two minutes about what kind of futures we can maybe imagine. Uh, sorry for this uh, inconvenience. Uh, we also uh, have to learn the lessons about what uh, IT and AI 
can learn us about how to redefine learning. And here are just some of the some uh, perspectives. It's about uh, uh, boundary and nature of the learning context, about composition of players who are involved in the learning process. And for example, now during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have seen that suddenly parents were much more uh, involved, uh, although maybe it was very, very hard for some of the parents and because they were not prepared. The format and the speed, about communication, about knowledge generation, management and sharing and utilization. <clears throat> so um, we have to look at the ecosystem and there is a new ecosystem for, I will, it says e-learning on the slide because I have borrowed this slide from the Commonwealth of Learning who had a very, very nice uh, workshop last week. But I would like to uh, suggest to take away the e because there need to be a new ecosystem for new learning. And the shift is from traditional program, which I said uh, earlier on, which are teacher dominating, which are offering by the university to some people out there who they don't care about, to uh, the student initiative. And that goes again, uh, belong to the, uh, the futures of education, learning to become. So we will have a learner perspective. And also from my first slide, um, when everything is available on Google and internet nowadays, what is education about? Just for me and just in time learning. <clears throat> um, Professor Shang, uh, who also was, um, who I borrowed this uh, slide from, has written a very interesting book about paradigm shift in education. <clears throat> when we're thinking about the future, the future started already yesterday. Although this initiative from UNESCO is for 2050 and, and beyond. But um, the future belongs to those who can imagine it, design it and execute it. This is also a slide I borrowed from this uh, Commonwealth of Learning um, um, webinar last week about future of our education after COVID-19. And they describe it like this. I will just leave it for uh, some seconds. You can read it yourself, what those three uh, headings are about. So there are a lot of opportunities, although this uh, um, terrible pandemic situation, but we have to rethink a lot and we have to take the opportunities out from it. So educational learning is about human rights and social justice. It is about diversity and inclusion in all means. So that, that's why I choose this uh, very nice uh, picture, picture of spices. There are different uh, tastes, different smell, different color, etc. Different texture. So we have to really see diversity in all means. Uh, OECD has written a rather recently report about future of education and skills for 2030 and come up with um, and some kind of model on uh, learning compass 2030. And the two most uh, important um, uh, things to think about is about transformative competences and taking responsibility. So how do we address that in our curriculums, in our exams, in our assessments, in our learning environments? I haven't seen uh, so often seen uh, learning outcomes uh, addressing those issues. Maybe you have. Congratulations in case you have. <laughs> so the compass they have they um, uh, have developed uh, together with uh, I mean it's not just them it is the uh, two research and uh, stakeholders all over the the world. The compass is about, of course, knowledge is important, but it's very much about values and attitudes as well, and about well-being, about, uh, as you see, transformative competences, taking responsibility, which I just showed, and reconciling tensions and dilemmas and creating new values. So it is about action, reflection, anticipa anticipation. So how can curricula and learning models and quality be assigned to that, to meet those demands. 
Here's also from the OECD uh, report. Uh, it is just some more, more text about what I've just uh, said from the, from the um, previous slide. Uh, so why it is important, for example, when students create new values, they ask questions, they collaborate with others, and they try to think outside the box. So again, about uh, creating new value, reconciling tension and dilemmas, and taking responsibilities. To do that, <coughs> what does that mean? There need to be some kind of sense of purpose, curiosity, open mindset, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, managed risks, agility, adaptability. So again, when we talk to quality, how do we address those kind of issues? Although I will talk about some quality models, and this is one of the report I was the research leader for, for ICD, it was came out in 2015, and over the 24 first um, hours, we had some 500 downloads. Um, me and my research team, um, we um, we um, surveyed uh, and researched about 40 plus quality models around the globe, and both those which were more uh, about accreditation but also about certification and about uh, guidelines, frameworks, um, benchmarking, and we uh, mapped them in uh, some kind of metrics and um, looked at uh, how they, how they uh, looked at quality. <clears throat> so um, we looked at everything from norm-based accreditation, as I said, to process-based enhancement because uh, there is a big difference. I often, as um, quality is one of my specialty, I often get the question, so what is quality? I mean, it depends. Accreditation is very much about when national agencies or authorities come and look at an institution, for example. And that is, of course, uh, good in one way, but on the other hand, the daily job shall continue at the working places, at the institutions, together with the students and with the teachers. So it is more about process-based enhancements, enhancement. And all those 40 models which we looked at were on the, um, this, um, um, this scale. So, um, of course, they differed in some ways, but they also had some, uh, some uh, important and some crucial things in common. And that was about, first of all, it depends on if you're looking on quality, about macro, meso, micro, or nano level. You need to have the ecosystem. The, ecosystem. the macro level is all, uh, often about uh, the, um, the national level. Um, maybe sometimes also the international meso is more about the institution. Micro is about the course, and nano is about you and me. How we deal with, quali with quality. So you need to see the ecosystem. Also, all those 40 models which we looked at included in one or another way uh, about uh, three or six aspects or dimensions. It was about management, uh, strategic planning and development, about the products as such, curriculum, course design, course delivery, and about the services to staff and to students. Uh, actually, I worked quite a lot uh, with those kind of models because I did it already in my dissertation in 2012 when I, and then, since that's, then I developed it in different ways. But I would like to add that <coughs> as the, I, what I've talked about until now is that we have to see the learner in the center and the, from the learner's perspective. And from the learner's perspective, there are some dimensions or indicators which are crucial. And we have seen that very, very uh, clear now during this COVID-19 um, a time <clears throat> when everything went on distance, but actually it went more on, not at distance education, but actually it was more about um, emergency remote teaching, and that is different from open online learning. But anyway, um, during this period of time, we saw very clear that flexibility, interactivity, accessibility, 
personal uh, dimensions, transparency, participation, presence, and trust are crucial. We knew that before, but that it has been very much more clear now. Yes, please, if you have any reflections or want me to stop, just uh, tell me or write in the, in the chat box. Um, in 2016, the European Commission came out uh, with this uh, quality framework for open education. There is a joint research center uh, for the European Commission. And as you can see, uh, already from this model, there are more or less the same kind of dimensions, which I mentioned to you previously. It is about four uh, transversal dimensions. It is about leadership, strategy, technology, and quality. And those are interrelated, all four of them. But they're also interrelated with the core dimensions, the six in the, in the middle of this uh, model, about content, pedagogy, recognition, collaboration, research, and access. For example, the, the mention about content is very much about uh, the use of open resources and open education resources and open access. <clears throat> and working with that, you have to change your pedagogy. You can't just have the same traditional one as you had before. So you see those are also related in different ways. And of course, you need to have the research about open online learning and open education. And you need to have the framework for quality when you're saying that you're uh, working on open education. And that's why I, you can't measure quality with the old system we had for the new paradigm we are in. Um, quality is very much today about you, the, you using open education and resources. As, and as you know, uh, over 200 member, uh, member um, uh, governments and, and countries adopted 25th of November, the new UNESCO recommendation about uh, open education and open educational resources. And that is the only way we can reach the SDG 4. It's the only way we can reach education for all. So that's why it is so important with those uh, UNESCO recommendation to really implement them. And it's not just more about, uh, not just about awareness raising as we had done for some 20 years already since 2002. Now it is time to act, <coughs> to implement it. And um, if you haven't uh, come across the, the recommendations, I very much encourage you to do it and to um, promote it in all kinds of means in wherever you are and also translate it into lo local uh, languages if that is the case. So from now on, when we look at education and learning and quality, from now on, everything is about open educational resources, open educational practices, open educational culture, and it has to be related to the UNESCO, sorry for the, mis the misspelling, to be related to the UNESCO OER recommendation, including monitoring and evaluation. So that's what, why we also need to have a change in our quality, uh, quality assurance and quality enhancement a paradigm, because it has to be related to those recommendations. And the recommendations uh, include um, those five areas. So you can see very clearly from here, it is not just about open textbooks and uh, recorded uh, lessons, which many people are thinking, not you, but some. It is about build the capacity of stakeholders to find a way off, of course, that is, that is crucial. And to, uh, to um, know about the different kind of um, licenses we have and to develop supportive policies at all levels about ensure inclusive and equitable access to quality OER, to nurture the accreditation, the creation of sustainability models for OER. And actually it is those four, because the fifth one about internationalization um, have an impact on all the others four. So it is not just a standalone. 
So everything from now on should be related to those five areas. It's easy, but it's also quite difficult. But if you, if you read those five uh, dimension, it is very clear that they are crucial to reach the SDGs and to open education for all. <clears throat> the monitoring is about those three uh, dimensions to deploy appropriate research mechanism and to measure the effectiveness and efficiency of OER policies and collecting good practices and to develop strategies to monitoring it. That's what I'm saying. Everything which had to do with quality from now on have to be related to those recommendations. So I will end my presentation here. And um, I think it is very important to have your uh, view and your reflections. Um, because uh, I have some suggestions and some uh, information, but it is really a dialogue and I would like to hear from you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, I am hoping, since we are not too many, um, I've seen that there are some comments in, uh, in the chat, but I would want people to raise their hands so that they can speak because we are not too many. Uh, you can here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we can have a conversation. Uh, you can raise up your hand, then we can. Uh, you can actually speak. Um, in the meantime, there was a comment from John. John was asking, "What is MOOC, MOOCs in the OER scheme of practice?" Although um, uh, Nicola uh, answered, but what is your take, Professor? Yes, it is a very good, um, good um, question. And it also goes belong to the question, which I very often hear that, oh, I found out that there's an internet. Um, it's an OER, it's free. I found it on internet. I mean, not everything you find on internet is free. Uh, it's free in the, the means of what we really are talking about when we're talking about uh, open education resources, that you also can adapt it, translate it, uh, modify it, uh, and even sell it, of course. And uh, many MOOCs today, unfortunately, uh, are not with OER. Sometimes, uh, nowadays, many MOOCs, in my opinion, and what I see, I, I used to take a lot of MOOCs uh, myself because I like to, I have done it since the beginning and I was the one who introduced it in Sweden. So I think I have done some over 60 plus MOOCs for, by now, but um, because I like to see the design, because that is also one of my research areas. But I see very much that uh, MOOCs today, today are some kind of this uh, freemium model where you have different kind of levels. <clears throat> the very first general basic, uh, they are, that is all often free, which means that you can, um, don't have to pay for it, but then the more services you would like to have, and you can even pay, sometimes pay for the material. And if you have, like to have some guidance, and as we all know, if you like to have a certificate, you have to pay for that. So I think the MOOCs are, there are so many models nowadays. Uh, I don't know if some of you, but I took the very first MOOC by, uh, by Stephen Downs and, um, and um, oh, what is that? I forgot his name <laughs> um, right now. But uh, the one on, um, on connectivism uh, and... Um, George Siemens. George Siemens, yes. George Siemens. I took that one and that was really, we, we, we built the course uh, uh, during the way we, we, we um, went through the course and we also built the assessments ourselves. Yes, George Siemens. Um, I see there is, um, so I don't know if that was some kind of answer. I mean, there are so many different kind of MOOCs nowadays. And there are even those uh, which are small, small open online courses, which are just, just tailor-made, for example, for, for some uh, target group. And there are, that, that used to be called SOOCs, and there are books, and there are, I mean, don't know how many abbreviations there are. <laughs> uh, so I see there is a question about um, uh, OEC, Open Educational Culture. Yes, uh, actually, I 
like that concept very much because that is about the ecosystem. It is not just about the, uh, I think uh, my message has been gone through that, uh, <clears throat> that you need to have this ecosystem, the holistic perspective. And especially when we talk about OER, it is not the resources, uh, just, just the resources. It, it is a very much about which those recommendations shows very clear. It is about capacity building. It is about having a policy. It is about having monitoring system in place. Uh, so, um, what, is, uh, we, we, what is very much needed is to change uh, the mindset, so to say, and the mindset is about culture, culture and values. It's not just, again, about facts and figures and the courses and the materials or if that is good or bad. <clears throat> it is about to have, have this culture with each and everyone within an institution. By the heart, by the hands, by the head, and how we perform and how we relate, how we are dealing with things, how we communicate, how we, yes, how we are doing everything. I think this um, concept of culture is very, very much discussed uh, right now, and not at least um, as we have this paradigm shift. It is about involvement, to get people involved, because when people are, uh, also the, the ones, the slides I showed from OECD, for example, about responsibility, taking ownership, that is about culture. Not because I, I am saying as a director or whatever, that we should be with OER. It should be the ownership of the individuals, and that is about culture. Maybe you have other opinions? But there used to be the, both OER, o, OEP, which is Open Educational Practices. That is more about the practices, how to do, deal with it, how to do it. But the culture is very much about mindsets, attitudes, values, how we relate, how we perform, how we communicate. And that goes also back, I will say, to the fourth industrial revolution, because it, that changed exactly the way we live, the way we work, the way we learn, the way we perform, the way we communicate the way we relate, the way we, yeah, everything. And also, um, it is sometimes easy to say that if we just had a strategy, if we just had a policy, then it should be easier. But we should, um, um, we should be the leader we want to have because everyone are leaders. And again, that goes back to culture. So be the leader yourself, which you want to have. Um, theoretical perspective on social justice. That is a very good point. I didn't um, maybe um, mention it uh, so much, but I will now take the opportunity. I will argue, um, uh, as I had in my title as well, that open educational resources, practices and culture is about social justice. And there is a discourse for the moment in this area because most of the open education resources are in English, which is not uh, the language which all people are speaking or can relate to, because language is not just about words, it's about um, integrity and about, uh, again, about culture and values. <laughs> and uh, also, um, most OERs are developed by people like you and me, professors um, with high level of competences. Um, of course, that is good because that is also a quality issue. Um, but most uh, OERs are developed by, yeah, um, very high level uh, educated people. And oh, as I said, that is good, uh, but um, you also should think about who are the OERs for? What are the needs for people out there? Um, and also, uh, we have to have the, uh, the gender perspective. That's why I also showed, uh, started with uh, the slide on STDs, because it is about uh, gender and equality and equity. Does uh, the OER which are developed or used, are they, um, are they, are they resonating or are they addressed to different kind of cultures, to gender, gender perspective, 
to the national uh, culture and context. So um, if you shall be very, very strict, um, I think there is a huge uh, discrepancy nowadays because uh, there is a gap. Um, most uh, developed OERs nowadays are not, um, I, I will not say most, but uh, because I don't uh, know everything, but if you look at the OER in general, um, you can say that maybe they're not always are addressing human rights and social justice and the SDGs dimensions. I will put it that way. And there uh, sounds like a right perspective on SG, or what is SG? Social justice, yes. Um, was, um, so Nicola, do you have any other perspectives on this? I think it was you who raised the issue. And was um, it Cheryl? It was Cheryl that, that raised it. Um, Cheryl, maybe you want to say something more about that? Cheryl, I think you need to enable your mic. Thanks, Nicola. Sorry. Um, in the work we've been doing, um, we've been using Nancy Fraser's, she's a, um, a philosopher. We've been using her work um, mm -hmm. to try and identify some of the economic injustices, the cultural injustices, and the political injustices. Yes. It provides quite a nice framework for seeing to what extent um, interventions such as OER are actually entrenching the same injustices or moving them in a sort of ameliorative fashion, just, you know, mm -hmm. making it a little better, or in mm -hmm. fact, really transforming, which I think is what you meant by earlier um, focusing on the SDGs and some of the, the ways of using education to become um, is transformative. Yes, very good point. Um, yes, um, uh, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I hear also very often that um, when, we're, when people are thinking about uh, OER, for example, they think about just to have it within their institution, within their course. Not They're not seeing uh, how it can have an impact uh, in the society, as you are saying, in the economic growth, in the social growth, and uh, all those, those dimensions in the society, and for not at least for lifelong learners. <clears throat> uh, Nicole, there was, you have, I have some news to share and thoughts. I also asked for some advice. Yes, please go ahead. So hi everyone. Um, basically, yeah, so the news I have is that we got some money from the Oppenheimer Trust uh, in South Africa. Um, so I'm at Rhodes University in Grahamstown or Makanda. And um, yeah, we got uh, 3.8 million. Wow. Uh, so that's quite a bit of money in, in, in rands. And um, what, what we, it, it was to support online teaching, not just uh, during uh, the pandemic, but afterwards as well. And um, I think one of the things that really helped us to get this is that we were advocating that we assist people not just with using the equipment and software that we budget it for, um, for people to create materials that are of a good quality, but also that these are openly licensed. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got a number of people interested in designing online courses and open courseware. And I'm just looking for some advice on how we could perhaps embed these principles that you've shared with us further um, in our work. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for, uh, and congratulations for, for um, those money and uh, the project you will run. Yes, what kind of advice? Um, well, the first advice is, um, uh, as I said, I said in one of my slides, everything from now on have to and should be, in my opinion, be related to the OER recommendation and the monitoring. 
because that, that will help you to have some kind of framework. And then of course also to relate it to the SDGs, but that is already embedded in the recommendations. But if you can try to, to uh, have the recommendation as a framework for your further work, uh, then I think it can be easier and maybe more fun for you <laughs> to, to work further on because then you can see the ecosystem and uh, how, it, uh, how it works in the context. And for sure, UNESCO will be very, very pleased because that is exactly what they would like to see. I mean, it's the, the recommendation is not, it's not just a piece of paper. Uh, it is um, working. Uh, it is a document, uh, although, but it should be implemented, implemented, and it should uh, um, um, get to live. Uh, I will be more than happy to discuss further on with you um, on that, if you like. I mean, outside this um, webinar. Um, Silvio, I see that you are here. Great. Um, you have a uh, language is a huge uh, obstacle, yes. Students are from rural areas, poorest areas in Brazil. Yes, access uh, to basic net technology and computers and internet is, of course, um, very, very crucial. And we have seen that also during this uh, pandemic that uh, that has really been an obstacle for many people around the world, and not at least for when everyone is working from home. And maybe both the parents, um, they have to use internet, uh, they have a lot of siblings in the family and um, maybe just one device of some kind. Um, so it has really, it's really important. And, and that is also what uh, both UNESCO, but also what uh, countries are, are really have to prioritize. Uh, yes, uh, about your design. Yes, I would be happy to work on you with you on that. Of course, there are, I mean, you can look at quality issues and um, I would like to um, to share with you both my own thoughts and uh, also my colleague Rory McGreal. Uh, Rory McGreal, uh, maybe some of you know, he's um, from Canada, he's an UNESCO OER and, and, I, and UNESCO ICD OER share. And uh, we work a lot together as I'm also an uh, OER ambassador so, uh, for ICD. So um, I often get this question and he as well, uh, what is um, good quality for OER? I mean, it is, um, you can't really answer that question because the question is in one or another way wrong. Uh, he used to say, and I used also to say, um, that uh, if a teacher or whoever it is can't, uh, can't uh, um, measure uh, any kind of OER in, in the area subject he or she is, um, she is in, then that person shouldn't be a teacher at all. <clears throat> because if you don't have the knowledge to, uh, to recognize good quality within your subject, um, that would be a problem. Not at, not at least for the for the learners, but also um, I mean it is more or less the same as saying. I mean um, all teachers have for all time been um, looking at uh, journal journal articles and uh, books or and this kind of materials printed materials often, and there's, that is not a problem for them to select uh, the references for a course for example they have done that for, I mean. That's one of the, the tasks for a teacher. So why should it be more difficult to measure uh, or to examine uh, something which is an OER? And also the other thing is the beauty of OER <laughs> is that they are not um, static. They should be developed. They should be improved. They should be translated. They should be contextualized. That is the whole purpose of it. I mean, every, especially nowadays, uh, nothing is fixed. We have really learned that uh, during this period. It, 
um, I would argue that uh, what we really need to, to do in, in the close future, which, be, which started yesterday, is to be very flexible, to be very agile, to really see, uh, look at purpose issues and to really, really, again, uh, take the learner's perspective. Any more questions or reflections? Um, there was, Karen at the beginning had kind of, uh, uh, it was an input that she said, yes, trust. That is why yeah. everyone keeps on asking about quality assurance too. I yeah. think that wasn't an issue before mm -hmm. uh, or in traditional learning environments. I don't know if she wants to add something to that or you can comment on it as it looks. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe I saw that comment as well. I think that was when I showed the, the slide on um, dimensions, which are used to be uh, um, be um, um, counted as a, a success factors for learners. I mean, if you don't have trust to something or anyone, you don't have an interest. You can't uh, then you can't learn. You need to trust. I mean, people. You need to trust material resources. So that is very, very crucial. And that has also been shown very, very explicit during this COVID-19 pandemic in spring. <clears throat> that suddenly, especially in the beginning, when uh, all teachers around the world, they just put out things um, here and there and they didn't care about it. And if you can't trust that this, it is seriously, then um, you lose uh, motivation and interest. And motivation and interest and fun I would say is the most, uh, one of the most important uh, dimensions to learn something. There is some, I think Mohammed has, he is in the waiting room. Mohammed, I, I met him. <laughs> no, he's as joining. I think he was kicked out of the system. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. As as because we we still have some time. Uh, anyone else who has an observation uh, the same way uh, Nicola shared her, uh, you know, what is going on in I call it Wakanda. She calls it Makanda. <laughs> um, and yeah, anyone else who has some comment or can you know continue the conversation. Maybe Cheryl wants to ask a question about the micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. Yes, what is the question about that? Uh, hi, that was actually a, almost a question for Nicola when you were talking about um, how you might be con um, advising um, people to continue to be using online courses and OER and I'm thinking that this whole, the, the idea of assessment and how you recognize uh, the work that people have done using open resources is a, a tricky area that we've got to grasp. It's no use just saying, go and learn and go and learn. We've, we've, we've got to find some mechanism and there are mechanisms that are already in place. So that was almost a suggestion, but I'd love to hear Eber's comment on micro credentials because that it's been around for a while, but it hasn't yet quite taken off. So I'd be interested in your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a good point. Um, uh, first of all, uh, in the model from uh, the European uh, Commission and uh, the Joint Research Center, recognition was one of the core uh, dimension, if you maybe recognize um, that. So recognition is very, very important. And also, um, before I say something about uh, micro-credentials, I will uh, um, add that we all know those five R's, but mainly developed by uh, David Willey, about retain, remix, uh, etc. cetera. Um, there is a discuss not a discussion, but there is the, there's a new discourse that there are actually six R's nowadays. And the sixth one is about recognition. We need to recognize both those who are developing or using, co-creating or whatever, if it is teacher, academics, but also the students. Students do a lot of work, but they never get recognized for it. 
So there again, there need to be a, a shift. So about uh, micro, micro credential. Um, yes, it is a good point. And I think uh, for the moment, it is very, very uh, hot topic. Um, the question is, what is micro credentials? <laughs> because no one uh, actually uh, we had a Eden's, uh, web, the Eden conference now for three days um, online and there was a special uh, session about micro credentials and also one of the keynotes addressing uh, micro credentials and his um, it was the, the keynote speaker was Antonio Camilleri uh, he is um, working on micro credentials for the European Commission and um, his first slide was about what is micro credential in reality. And after we have discussed and defined that, then we can go further on in the discussion. Although then he had a presentation for some 40 minutes, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> um, it is not so very easy. Um, but actually, there's a very, very nice report uh, from the European Commission uh, about micro credentials. So uh, first of all, I would like to, you to have a look at that. You would like to, to know more about it. But I, um, uh, I anyway agree that we, we need to have some kind of recognition system because nothing, especially uh, when we're talking about um, formal and informal learning are more and more merged. Uh, never, uh, not everything is about um, degrees any longer. Um, and especially uh, universities are not caring about lifelong learners. It is more or less impossible to go in and out into the system because you need to start from scratch uh, from, for the bachelor's and then for the master and then for the PhD. And there's nothing in between. So um, there need to be a disruption in the, there's a system um, failure, I will say. Uh, and we need to solve that. And one way is uh, probably to have the use of um, micro credentials. And then I also think that um, badges is more and more used. Uh, so that is um, also very uh, good development. And also that um, OER uh, and micro, micro learning is very, very tight to connect it because every, a lot of things today is about micro learning. You, you have to learn just in me and just for time, just for me and just for in time learning, as I had my first slide. Uh, when you need something, um, and that is very much about uh, micro learning. Um, I would like to see if I said something special about micro credentials. Um, I think. Um, in one way, there is some kind of hype <laughs> about micro credential nowadays because um, everyone th thinks that that will solve most of the problems. But as long as we don't exactly know what it is and how they should be used and why they should be used, it is um, difficult. Then we just have a new concept or a new word. <laughs> and the, but anyway, I, I think that um, there will be a shift as well that. It is maybe not just the universities to have a say about credentials or degrees or whatever, or it is the labor market. It is the society. But I will say that um, you sh it is a good idea to have, um, although maybe it's not credentials, credits, but um, uh, but the bachelor movement, I think it's really, really good that you you collect your badges and then you um, um, have that as a, in your CV as, as you have everything else. Um, I will also say that um, this system with the, the degree uh, system uh, have to be changed because especially if we really would like we we'll embrace the, the concept and the movement of lifelong learning, there may need to be smaller pieces of courses or modules or micro learning or whatever. So you can build your own, um, um, your own education. That will be a shift, I will say. Then of course, I mean, to be a nurse or to be a doctor, you need to have uh, something and that is very special in one way, but 
there should be more flexibility in between. Yes, impact. Uh, very good that you said that. Um, that is, uh, um, I think, one of the most important quality dimensions. What kind of impact does things have and how can we look at that? And then we have to, again, look at the ecosystem at macro level, micro level, meso level and nano level. At what level and for whom does it have an impact? And as who was saying that before about uh, the economic growth and the social growth uh, as education, I mean, that again, has it an impact for the individual learning to become? That is uh, one dimension. Has it an impact for the society? Uh, yes, exactly. I think it is this one. I recognize the address. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it is a really good one. Um, actually, um, uh, I don't know if I, if I have it here, but um, I remember that. Uh, and, and by the way, Antonio Camilleri, he was one of the, my researchers in the, in the um, research for the quality model. So I know him very, very well. But if I remember right, he said that um, his presentation from um, this conference, which was really, really good presentation, are available uh, here on the European Commission's um, page as well. Um, what I can do is to uh, maybe write to you, Mohammed, as I have, uh, maybe you too, um, Irena, uh, the, the address where you can find this presentation. Okay, um, I, I see that we, we, we are almost four minutes to the time. Uh, if someone wants to say a final, final word, that would be really welcome. Um, but I think we've had a really useful and very uh, engaging uh, webinar, um, a session that is really close knit because you were so few of us. Um, and thank you, Professor, um, uh, for being here for us. Thank you, Mohammed, for introducing her to us. <laughs> we appreciate. And I hope you'll come back again and, 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 and uh, talk to us about something else. I mean, we will find, I'm sure we can find another topic that you can present to us. I hope you'll make time. Uh, yes. We appreciate you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much again for the invitation and for being together with you. And um, Maybe my final word will be that um, be the leader you want to have. Well, that's, that's wonderful, yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a, um, a form that I'm kindly asking uh, the participants to give us feedback and perhaps tell us what, what else you want to see uh, presented in the Image Africa uh, webinars, uh, the series that we always have and we appreciate you always. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor. Thank and you. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone, and enjoy and stay safe. Uh, yeah. We still have a situation, yes. Yeah, stay thank safe. You very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.